All right, so you guys remember I talked about demons two episodes ago. Really? I did. What? Go did back you and talk listen. About demons? I, I think, think it's so. 69. Oh. Or is it 68? I can't remember. Uh, I think, I think it was it's 69. 69. Oh my gosh. Dibbic. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so that it, it seemed to have um pretty big response. Like a lot of people DM'd me personally and they're just like, I had to turn it off. Thank you for the warning. Or, oh my gosh, something happened to me. Or I told you about Dom <laughs> when he saw the oh, crazy yeah. lady. One of our listeners, who will remain anonymous, said, quote, I'm not even done listening to Charlie's story today, but I've got a wild effing story about addiction, possession. This just happened to me and my boyfriend like a month ago. Scariest thing I've ever, ever, ever been through. Anyway, she's like, I'm going to do my best to type it all up and I'll send it to you guys. So I was basically like, I am intrigued and terrified. You know, and since this is like a personal experience, I was, I don't know, I just feel different about it. Like having been told this directly from the person who experienced it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to call her CJ. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that. So... CJ starts, she sends me your email. She says, let me know what you think about it. And I read it and it's a wild story. And it starts, okay. First off, I hate, hate, hate this stuff. She's not a fan of demonic possession. Um, and if you haven't guessed already, trigger warning, we're dealing with stuff like that. So if you're not comfortable with that, fast forward to Sean or DJ. <laughs> So she says, so I recently made a really good friend who happens to be an energy balancing, basically energy healing healer. Hmm. Um, she thought before it was 100% bullshit, but after experiencing these things, she thinks it is 100% real. So she makes this friend and then later on has the experience, right? I had a few things happen. I knew I needed to make changes to my life, my own life, and I started to understand what evil is out there and how to protect yourself and your home and never to leave yourself vulnerable. As I'm diving deeper into the whole energy thing, I notice something changing about my boyfriend and I begin to have a bad feeling. So that's where we start. She's made this friend and as she's kind of learning about these things and opening herself up to the idea, she notices these changes in her boyfriend. So quick background on the boyfriend and his life. He's a veteran. Thank you for your service. Uh, he was in the military for 12 years and was deployed several tours and has major PTSD from the things he saw and had to do. Due to the PTSD and the injuries he sustained while there, addiction started to take over. So first it was like pain pills and stuff to deal with the physical pain. It was for his injuries, but it quickly progressed to drugs and alcohol, not just for the pain, for the emotional pain, all, all that stuff. After a long time of battling these addictions, he had become, or he had overcome everything. So he got rid of all the drugs, all the pills, and the only thing that remained was alcohol. So these, this experience, I'm going to break it up into two parts. It's her experience and his experience, and it takes place over the span of one week. That's so much already. What? Just the experience of... Uh... You're trying to become sober, oh. that whole process. I just watched Beautiful Boy. Oh, yeah. You ever watch that? Mm -mm. It's with uh, Steve Carell and Timothy Chalamet. Mm -mm. It's heavy, bro. Yeah. Really? It's just father, son, and he gets into drugs like starting at like 16 and goes until college and just that battle. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it kind of makes sense, I guess. I probably should just go straight, straight to the story, but he's progressed in his life, he's getting better. He's doing better things. He's almost there. He has this one last thing to kick. And this is when he gets targeted. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Kind of yeah. makes sense. Yeah. There's the same thing in the movie. Really? And then I assume there's going to be some type of vicious cycle. Oh my gosh. We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> okay. So like I said, this takes place over the course of a week. And these two, boyfriend and girlfriend, they are in a long distance relationship. So she's out of state and he's in another state. So over the course of this week, she notices her boyfriend is drinking a little more than normal, a little earlier than normal. And she says at the first, at the beginning of the week, it's just subtle changes. Mm -hmm. 
And previously, when he's drunk, he's a super nice, happy drunk. And everything is jokes, everything's lighthearted. So it's not, it doesn't feel like that much of a problem. Mm -hmm. But slowly, it seem, it kind of feels different. So on Tuesday, they call, they text all the time, they even FaceTime all the time. 7 a.m., they're talking, and he's already pretty drunk. 7 a.m. So this is new. This is different. She is talking to him and can tell that something's not okay. And she has a feeling that she needs to do something. So she calls one of his family members who's in his state, says, hey, I really think you need to go check on him. So that aunt shows up. She watches on FaceTime as the aunt pours all the alcohol down the drain, says, you know, let's get over this. We'll get over this together. And uh, she said on the screen, she watched him go from a funny drunk and he snapped and became angry, pissed off. And she said it was kind of hard to watch. It was, you know, crazy to see him just become so angry so fast. It started with phone calls is where she noticed the biggest difference. They would always start good, start normal. How's your day? Oh my gosh, this, that. But then in the middle of sentences, his voice would change and it would become darker and deeper. And he would just start saying over and over incessantly, I need to kill someone. Dude, flags. I need to kill anyone. I need to kill myself. He would start saying things like, I hate you. Like, I never loved you. I hate you. You're a crazy bitch. Things like this. And then he would switch and just say, everyone hates me. I need to die. I need to leave. And he would repeat this over and over and over. It would get worse and worse and worse. And then it would just go back to normal. And he'd come back. And, and she said she could like feel he was back. The him. And then he'd switch again. And he'd just start mumbling. He, she said she saw like a physical shift in his face. He had green eyes. And she said they would become dark. Almost black. And he would do this cycle where he'd just talk about death, suicide. He'd start reliving the scariest, worst moments in Iraq out loud, just telling her the worst things he'd ever seen, the worst things he thought, things he wanted to do. And then all of a sudden he'd switch and go back and say, I love you. I love you so much. And then on a dime, you crazy bitch, no one loves you. Everyone hates you. And so she's sitting there on the phone with him, a state away. Like, could you imagine, have you ever had someone struggle or go through something that you love and you can't help them? It's like the worst feeling in the world. And I could not imagine adding in a state of distance. Like you yeah. would feel so helpless. Was she doing this on the phone or is she doing like, like a Zoom or Skype? I call? think they would FaceTime and stuff. Okay. So they would go back and forth between phone calls, FaceTime and texting. Okay, so but she a lot could, of it was visual. She could tell like physical differences and yes. vocal differences. Yes. Wow. Um, she said during this whole time, it would just repeat himself, repeat himself, go on for hours. And she'd sit there, talk him down. He'd come back to normal. It would be normal for a while. And then all of a sudden the switch and he'd go and then he'd go off and do it again. And she said, I don't know how, I don't know why, but all I knew was I needed to be there for him. It's like, that's the only thing I could do was to be there for him, try to talk him down, try to talk him into getting some sleep, eating some food. Third day. So that's day one and day two is just this cycle. On the third day, she said she jumps on a call with him, FaceTime, and this time she only catches glimpses of his normal self. So only a couple times in the day she thought it was actually him. The rest of the time, it's this something else. She said on this day, his eyes were completely blank. Most of the call, most of the interactions, he was expressionless. She said he looked like a serial killer. Barely moving. His eyes were dead. She said, I could feel even through the screen, like the darkness coming off him. And something was not okay. So she called the same aunt, kind of brought her up to speed and was like, you need to go, you need to go check on him. And he has a son who's with him. So the aunt shows up, picks up the son, packs up some things. She's there for maybe an hour, packs up some things, um, probably encourages him to get some sleep. And he, I don't know, goes into the other room or something. She takes the son and leaves. 
and now he's alone in the house. And she said he was a shell of himself. Just like sitting in the corner, barely moving, reacting to nothing, all alone in this house. She said while talking to him, he would have, he would be looking at her and then like look off to the camera and start talking to people that weren't there. And those people, from what she could gather, like his conversation with them, were convincing him to kill himself. And she's just watching this. The only thing she can think is just stay with him. Bring him back. Stay with him. Bring him back. She said as she's talking to him, she's starting to notice things in the house. She looks past him into the kitchen. And he's in the army, or he was. He served. His house is spotless before this. The kitchen is a complete wreck. Plates, dishes, things are turned over. It's disgusting. And she's like, something's not right. Something is not right. She knows at this point he's barely slept. It's been like two or three days since he's eaten food and all he's been doing is drinking almost continuously. She said by the fifth day, there was no rational talking to him. There was no conversation back and forth. He had gone completely black. She said at one point, he shuts his phone off and she doesn't talk to him for 24 hours. Text, call, nothing. So she calls the family again, says you need to go check on him. Family comes find him, finally convince him, pour out the rest of the alcohol that he had and to take a nap and eat food. And he does. After this nap, he calls CJ and she goes, I knew it was him the second he got back on the phone. Like he was back. He seemed coherent. He seemed back. He seemed almost positive, but he said he just felt insanely sick. Like he was getting over a hangover, but this time it was big. So she's like, okay, just nap it off, eat some food, continue to sleep. And he says, hey, uh, I can't remember the last five days. She's like, what? He said, basically was like, what day is it? She said, it's Sunday. And he says, he can't remember anything past Monday night, like nothing. But they feel like they're kind of through the, the worst of it. So they're like, okay, go take a nap. Just get better. And he's like, okay. And this is where we switch to the boyfriend's point of view. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to finish the whole thing. At this point, I feel like there's not a lot you can do. I'm thinking the best thing is like therapy. But even that's not like immediate, you know, Mm -hmm. not like the ER or something. Um, I know you'd feel just lost. Like what I do and especially not being able to be there. Yeah. It would be so difficult. So from his point of view, he's, he, he says he has zero recollection of like those four days. And how does he feel at this point? He says terrible. Mm-hmm. It's like the worst hangover, like hangover ever. Yeah. yeah. So he decides he's now alone in the house. His, his aunt's going to keep his son one more night just so he can focus on getting better. He feels so sick. He tries to go to sleep and sleep it off. And this is like the first time in four days he's slept. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This dude has a good support system, it sounds like. Yeah. Good people in his life. Thankfully. Uh-huh. So he's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to go to bed. Goes up to his room, lays down, is tossing and turning all night. So he goes, okay, I don't know. I'm going to go sleep in the front room. It's a little more open. I just, I'll feel better. And he goes to the front room, lays down. And as he's kind of tossing and turning and, and falling asleep, something out of the corner of his eye catches his attention. And he looks over at the blinds of the window. And he sees something. And he gets closer and he can see something is written across the entire blinds. And not only just one blind, every blind. Are these the vertical or horizontal blinds? I think they're the horizontal. Okay. They're the ones that like you can raise up with like the weird Yeah, it's probably like 50 little wooden things. Flats almost. And what it says over and over and over is, you, this house you this house you this house hundreds of times so he gets closer to it he's looking at it puts his thumb up and rubs it doesn't go away it's almost like it's scratched into the wood first thought is when my aunt came over she had her kids so his little cousins it was about an hour maybe they wrote this and he's staring at it and at this point he knows he lost four days So he knows he's not 100%. And he thinks, okay, am I imagining this? 
takes out his phone, takes a picture, looks at the phone and zooms in, clear as day on his phone. Fuck you, this house. Fuck you, this house. And he gets overwhelmed, sets his phone down and goes, oh, oh, like I need a minute. Goes to the kitchen, fills up a glass of water. And as he's drinking, he's looking out the kitchen window and sees on the blinds of the kitchen window, fuck you, fuck this house. Same, written on every blind across the entire thing, like almost etched into the blinds. So, he's not still thinking it's the cousins, the kids. No, because he looks at the other window in the kitchen, same thing on those blinds. And he runs to every window in the house. And these are written on every blind of the house. That's so menacing, dude. Even even like if he was like episodic and he did that, still. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Any scenario yeah. you play out is <laughs> yeah. like not chill. Not, not cool. Even if it is your cousins, it's like that's kind of not chill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because the dedication to write it on every blind of every window of every house. And scratched in almost. And if you like know anything about like portals, aka doors and windows, it's just like, and if you know anything about like spell casting and stuff like that, is there, there's so many connotation there that's like eerie. Mm -hmm. So he's overwhelmed. Almost like he's trapped in the house. Rightly so. Yeah. Every single window has this written over the house. So he's like, I... And it's in the middle of the night, and he goes, "I gotta, I have, a, I have to have a smoke." So he steps onto his back porch, lights his cigarette, and in the light of his cigarette, he looks across his yard, and there's a C train or a trailer that his landlord keeps there to like store stuff in, in in huge letters written across the front of the C train is F "You, F this house." I'd imagine his heart like stops. He said he put out the cigarette, slowly walked up to the trailer and felt onto the trailer. And he's like, the words were there. He's still not 100% sure. Takes out the phone, takes a photo. It's clear as day in the photo. If we were to go along with the idea that it was him, like he was outside, unconscious, like doing this, mm. you know, like if he was in his house, at least he's kind of like confined within the walls of his home. But if he's like wandering outside, like where else? did he go mm. you know if it was him but if it's someone else then they're getting into his house you know so i'm sure all of these things are going through his head yeah and at this point he's so overwhelmed and so tired all he can think is i gotta go lay down so he goes back inside and he lays down he said he slept for about a solid hour which is good at this point really solid for him wakes up darkness it's like in the middle of the night also, keep in mind, this is after he's poured out all alcohol and after he's completely stopped drinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, he's woken up. He had his rest. And he remembers the writing, the windows. Looks over at the window and squints. And it's dark. It, it must be his mind playing tricks. And he walks up to the blinds. And there is nothing on the blinds. Runs to the kitchen. Nothing on the kitchen blinds. Nothing on any of the windows. And he goes, surely the trailer. So he steps out on the back porch, middle of the night, nothing on the trailer. Only this time, as he's standing on his porch in complete darkness, he notices on the right side of the trailer in the back corner of his yard, the darkest corner, like covered in trees, almost pitch black. There's an old shed, dilapidated, covered in vines, weeds, barely kept up. But he can see in the doorway of the shed, the silhouette of a couple people standing there. He said the silhouette looked like adolescent teens, like teenagers. Several things run through his mind super quickly. How the hell did they get back here? There's gates with locks. There's like no other way to get back there. What the hell are they doing in the middle of my backyard on a Sunday night for no reason? And what am I going to do? So he decides he's going to approach them and he's going to ask them what they're doing, why they're here. As he gets closer, he can kind of make out more and more details and realizes it's two boys and three girls standing in a circle. All of their heads are bowed and they're all wearing low caps or a hoodie. And they're all looking away from him. So I think he starts out by saying like, what are you guys doing here? No answer. And he gets a little closer. 
he said he comes right up to the trailer and he decides if I go straight, I'll have way less of an escape route. If I'm about to fight five teenagers, I need an escape route. So he's he decides he's going to kind of backtrack, go around the trailer, and it will bring him right by them, and he'll have like a clear way to run. So he goes, okay. Goes back, goes around the trailer. He's going to come around the trailer pretty hot. You know, he'll be about 10 feet away from him. So he runs past the trailer, comes into the clearing, sees all of them, and he goes, get the f*** out of my yard. And he, as he yells that, keep in mind he's about 10 feet from him, he sees... They're all standing around one girl. She's in the middle of the circle. She's wearing a black and white checkered hoodie. And as he does that, he's coming in hot, getting closer and closer to him. The girl bends at the waist, except it's backwards. And he said out of where her waist is, it looked like arms begin to come out like this. He said it stopped him dead in his tracks. What is going on, dude? He literally like took his final step and just stopped, skid to a halt, eyes wide, and he sees this thing shape-shifting. But the second he stopped, it stopped shape-shifting. And like one second passes, he spins on a dime and sprints back to his house. He reaches his patio and yells, I don't want any trouble. Please stop. Please leave. I'm sorry. Slams the door. Lock. Grabs a flashlight and shines it into the back corner. It's a powerful flashlight. He said the beam of light gets swallowed up within like 10 feet. It's just completely black. So he takes a flashlight, runs to the front room, sits in his lazy boy, and doesn't move or sleep the entire rest of the night. Okay, so that was Sunday night. Monday morning, 9.30 a.m. He th- He's like stayed up the entire night, didn't sleep. He's just sitting in his chair. Mm-hmm. 9.30, he feels comfortable enough. He goes, okay, I got to try to sleep. So he kicks the lazy boy back, leans back, and right when he closes his eyes, he hears a woman yell in a high-pitched voice, I see you. Simultaneously, someone runs upstairs and across the top stair floor. His eyes pop open and he sits up in his chair. They're in the house. Runs upstairs, checks the bathroom. Shower curtain, nothing. Checks all rooms. There's nothing up there. House is silent. Goes back to his chair, sits down, closes his eyes again. And this time he hears a whisper in his ear and it says going to give up so easy i'm gonna kill you Holy shit! <laughs> so his eyes open up again he can hear every time he closes his eyes he can hear something whispering or footsteps upstairs so he thinks i gotta call cj call cj the second cj's on the phone the voices stop but he can hear someone pacing upstairs CJ talks to him all day, keeps him grounded, keeps him company, and just listens to him. I, I, I think I forgot to say, but she said even during the week when he was going off on the phone saying the worst things possible, she said, I, it almost felt like an outer body experience for me. Like I was sitting there and he was saying these horrible things, but it was almost like I wasn't hearing them or I wasn't in my body. Like she was almost, prote- I don't know. Like maybe protected from it or just separated from it. Hmm. And during this day, she's just trying to talk to him, listen to him, be there for him. And she says, hey, I have a friend. I have a friend who's an energy healer. Maybe you should talk to her. And I think he agrees. He just agrees. He's like, okay. Next day, he has his son back. So he gets his son ready for school, gets him off to school, gets himself ready. And he's going to talk to CJ's friend. This is what I'm just going to read what CJ's friend said. So she's an energy healer. And she said he gets on the phone with her. I think it might have been FaceTime. And CJ's not there. It's just the boyfriend and the energy healer. Before he's able to fully tell her everything that's happened, CJ's told him her very little about the situation. 
almost before he starts talking, she says, you have five entities attached to you. One of them has been inside of you. He said, that's why I couldn't remember the five-day drinking binge because she, or the demon who had been inside of him, had taken over completely. I she, thought it was four. In the backyard, two boys, three girls. A four-day oh, blackout. I, th- I guess it was five. You said five and four, but oh, still my bad. five. She explained, okay, this is what the energy healer says to him. Drinking cracks open your crown chakra and leaves you susceptible to evil entities slipping into the cracks. She told me that these demons have likely been with me for a long time and have simply just been waiting for the right opportunity to jump in. There were specific places in my home where there there was dark energy built up. For example, my coffee table. She said this is most likely because this is where you sit with your cocktails and where you set your drinks. She also explained to me that my son, during those days of me basically blacking out, had his own guardian angels surrounding him and that he was untouched completely by the entities and the experiences going on in the house. So they go through their process. Um, they do the energy balancing. They have prayers. And they were able to clear all the entities and dark energy out of the house. He said, I've been sober for over a month. My son and I and our home are safe and we have had no more experiences And the heavy, dark feeling in my home, my backyard, and even myself are gone. Things have changed a lot since this extreme experience. We both have made a vow that neither of us ever want to drink ever again in our lives. We are also both extremely careful about who and what we allow into our home. And he closes, they close. I don't know who wrote this, but they said, God is real, but so is the devil. And he will fight like hell to take you down. So say your prayers and watch your back. CJ. Well. Dude, what a heavy story, dude. I know. I think even talking to her back and forth after she sent the story in, I said, she was like, don't get me wrong. Like, I love scary stories, but this was different. And I I would agree with her. Like, I love scary stories. And there's just something so different about like, you know, I saw a Bigfoot in the woods <laughs> to like, I went through five days of hell where something inside of me was convincing me to kill myself or harm other people. Like those are very different. You know what I mean? I did, however, like this story because it's a cautionary tale and it ends, thankfully, happily. They're all better. And in talking to her afterwards, she was like, it's completely different. Mm-hmm. And we are all like tighter and more careful and safe and like we know where we stand and you know i i'm not saying that you're saying this but i also don't want to discredit people who have like seen bigfoot totally you know or like being in the woods and like feeling in danger Mm -hmm. um or something that equates to that uh, because they're all terrifying they can all be traumatizing but this one seems it's like like weaved with their personal lives like it, it like take away the kids he saw, the writing on the windows and whatnot. And what's he left with? It's his road to sobriety. Mm. So that's like deeply personal. So throwing everything else into the mix, the people in the house and the whisperings uh, just it brings it closer to home and more to life. And it's more relevant. And I think too, in a lot of different situations and scary situations, the only real thing on the line is your mortality, which in itself is terrifying and can is traumatic 100%, not taking away from that. But in these experiences, it's way more than your mortality that's at stake. It's like your sanity, your sanity, your salvation, your, your um, free will, your agency, like your soul maybe is like having it succumb to this dark thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know. Just so much more gravity to a story. Yeah. Yeah. like this mm. anyway cj thank you so much i appreciate everyone who writes in it always seems to me and this has been a theme that i've seen throughout my life throughout the lives of others but when you make like the conscious decision to do better it always seems like that's when the most opposition comes up and that's kind of what it sounds like here is like 
I don't know. I just hope that it stays good. Yes. Like a month. Like congrats, con- congrats, congrats to CJ's boyfriend for being sober for a month. But at the same time, like those events are s- still seem like it's right behind. Pretty fresh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the important of like once you get there, it's not it's not done. We like to say, you know, endure to the end. <laughs> but really, though, it's like it's now an ongoing battle to stay there. Yeah. But definitely can do it. This might be uh, too sensitive. I assume not, but the pictures. I didn't ask, but maybe I will. Because I could conceivably see wanting to delete those. Mm -hmm. Or maybe afterward there was nothing in them. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I'll I'll, I'll ask. I'll reach out. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's me tonight, guys. Well, thank you, and thank you, CJ. That's a wild story. Who's next? I'm next. Let's do it. I don't know if I can fill those shoes. 